Thank you for watching Murder, Monsters, and Mysteries. Tonight, we take a look at a strange cryptid, the Little People, also known as Pygmies. Some of the first accounts of Pygmies go back to Homer. According to Homer, there once existed a tribe of Pygmies, or Little People, who were one and a half feet tall. They were constantly at war with cranes, referenced in the Iliad Book 3. This Greek myth recounts how the Pygmies lived in caves and rode on rams. Annually, the tribe partook in a great war with the cranes, the goal being to eat as many crane eggs and chicks as possible to keep the vicious crane population in check. Flemish artist Adrian Colliart illustrates this very event in his engraving, Fight Between Pygmies and Cranes where we see the tribe gallop forth on their rams and billy goats, and a deadly skirmish between human and beast ensues. This plate is from the large series, Benation Sferium Arium Piscium, hunts of wild animals, birds, and fish. When the series was commissioned, hunting scenes were of great interest, for Jan van der Strutt had just made drawings of hunting imagery for tapestries to decorate the Medici village in Poggio al Caiano. The success of van der Straat's scenes were the basis of this printing epic, which was first published in 1596 and again in the following centuries. Something rather curious takes place within the set of engravings, for Homer's pygmies seem to have found their way from one plate to another. In cavemen chasing elephants, several tiny individuals outfitted in the same garb as the pygmies in plate 22 have launched an attack on some unsuspecting elephants in book 8 of pliny the elder's natural history we read that the caveman on the frontier of ethiopia whose only food is elephant meat obtained by hunting climb up trees near the elephant's track and keep a lookout for the last of the whole column and jump down onto the hind parts of its haunches a quote which is very aptly illustrated by the engraving, with the exception that the Ethiopians seem to have been depicted as pygmies. Homer's tribe was said to live on Oceanus, a location sometimes interpreted as the Nile Africa, where cranes migrate. The cranes make for the rivers of ocean to bring death and destruction to the pygmies launching their wicked assault from the air. So it seems that the writings of these two ancient authors Homer and Pliny, were combined in the creation of these two engravings. Whether either literary source was based on factual evidence or fantasy concerning the existence of an ancient pygmy tribe, the texts and engraved series stimulates a hunger to learn more about these little people. Written in the Iliad, Now when the men of both sides were set in order by their leaders, the Trojans came on with clamor and shouting, like wildfowl, as when the clamor of cranes goes high to the heavens. When the cranes escape the winter time and the rains unceasing and clamorously wing their way to the streaming ocean, bringing the pygmy and men bloodshed and destruction. At daybreak, they bring on the baleful battle against them. According to Aristotle in History of Animals, the story is true. These birds migrate from the steppes of Scythia to the marshlands south of Egypt, where the Nile has its source. And it is here, by the way, that they are said to fight with the pygmies. And the story is not fabulous. But there is in reality a race of dwarfish men, and the horses are little in proportion, and the men live in caves underground from Pliny's natural history. Beyond these in the most outlying mountain region, we are told of the three-span pygmy, who do not exceed three spans, that is, 27 inches in height. The climate is healthy and always spring-like, as it is protected on the north by a range of mountains. This tribe Homer has also recorded as being beset by cranes, it is reported that in springtime, their entire band, mounted on the backs of rams and she-goats armed with arrows, and they go in body down to the sea and eat crane eggs and chicks 
and that this outing occupies three months and that otherwise they could not protect themselves against the flocks of cranes who would grow up and that their houses are made of mud and feathers and eggshells. Aristotle says the pygmies live in caves, but in the rest of the statement above them he agrees with the other authorities. And now for a brief commercial break. From the evil one deliver me. From the evil one deliver me. At the hour of my death. At the hour of my death. Call me and bid me to come to thee. Call me and bid me to come to thee. Call me and bid me to come to thee. Give me the compass. If you don't, we'll take her eyes. We'll take your family's eyes. We'll make this whole town blind. should have come here first come to me. Call uh. from imagines by philostratus Heracles among the pygmies while Heracles is asleep in libya after conquering antaeus the pygmies sit upon him with the avowed intention of avenging antaeus for they claim to be brothers of antaeus high-spirited fellows not athletes indeed, nor his equals at wrestling, but earthborn and quite strong besides. And when they come up out of the earth, the sand billows and waves. For the pygmies dwell in the earth just like ants and store their provisions underground. And the food they eat is not the property of others, but their own and raised by themselves. For they sow and reap and ride on a cart drawn by pygmy horses. And it is said that they use an axe on stalks of grain, believing that these are trees. But ah, their boldness. Here they are advancing against Heracles and undertaking to kill him in his sleep, though they would not fear him if he were awake. Meanwhile, he sleeps on the soft sand, since weariness has crept over him in wrestling. And, filled with sleep, his mouth open, he draws full breaths deep in his chest, and sleep himself stands over him in a visible form, making much, I think, of his own part in the fall of Heracles. Antaeus also lies there, but whereas art paints Heracles as alive and warm, it represents Antaeus as dead and withered and abandoned to the earth. The army of the pygmies envelops Heracles. While this one phalanx attacks his left hand, these other two companies march against his right hand as being stronger. Bowmen and a host of slingers lay siege to his feet, amazed at the size of his shin. As for those who advance against his head, the pygmy king has assumed the command at this point, which they think will offer the stoutest resistance and they bring engines of war to bear against it as if it were a citadel. Fire for his hair, mattocks for his eyes, doors of a sort for his mouth, and these, I fancy, are gates to fasten on his nose, so that Heracles may not breathe when his head has been captured. All these things are being done, to be sure, around the sleeping Heracles. But lo, he stands erect and laughs at the danger, and sweeping together the hostile forces he puts them in his loin skin and I suppose he is carrying them to Eurytheus. From the travels of Sir John Mandeville that river goeth through the land of pygmies where the folk be of little stature that be but three span long and they be right fair and gentle after their quantities both the men and women 
and they marry them when they be half a year of age and get children, and they live not but six or seven years in the most. And he that liveth eight year, men hold him there right passing old. These men be the best workers of gold, silver, cotton, silk, and all such things, of any other that be in the world. And they have oftentimes warred with the birds of the country, that they take and eat. This little folk neither labor in lands, ne'er in vines, but they have great men amongst them of our stature, that till the land and labor amongst the vines for them. And of those men of our stature they have as great scorn, and wonder as we would have among us for giants if they were among us. There is a good city amongst others where there is dwelling great plenty of those little folk and it is a great city and fair and the men be great and dwell amongst them but when they get any children they be as little as the pygmies and therefore they be all for the most part all pygmies. For the nature of the land is such the great Chan let us keep this city full well, for it is his, and albeit that the pygmies be little, yet they be full reasonable after their age, and can both wit and good and malice enough. Pygmies have been spotted in more modern times as well. Detroit, Michigan, 1701. The founder of Detroit, Antoine de la Moth Cadillac, was having a party on March 10th during this event, a mysterious fortune teller allegedly appeared with a cat on her shoulder, and when she read his palm, she told him he was destined to start a great city, but that this new colony would be a place of great strife and bloodshed. She also warned him to pay heed to the Nan Rouge, and to not upset it, as this would certainly mean his downfall, which the skeptical leader mostly scoffed at. When Cadillac finally did found his city, he reportedly went out with his wife one night for a quiet walk and overheard two men complaining about the new city. One of them saying that he had seen Le Petit Nan Rouge, which was a sure sign of bad things to come. At the time, this amused Cadillac, but soon after he reported that a deformed, dwarf-like creature, covered in blackish red fur and with beady fierce red eyes, shambled into view, and that it had crooked, horrendous teeth. Cadillac allegedly bashed the foul creature over the head with a cane and told it to go away. But the fearsome gnome just laughed and scampered off. After that, Cadillac was supposedly beset by a myriad misfortune, eventually dying alone and penniless. The creature was spotted multiple times around that same period, with one frightened farmer claiming to have seen it on the roof of a barn trying to rile up the horses and another farmer claimed that the thing would appear at night to peer into his windows and steal his chickens. More well known than these scattered sightings was an encounter with one of the little beasts on July 30th, 1763. On this day, 250 British troops had amassed in preparation for a surprise attack on a rebel force made up of a confederacy of Native Americans that had defied British post-war policies in an insurgent uprising known as Pontiac's War, named after one of its fiercest leaders, Ottawa, Chief Pontiac. Nearly 60 British soldiers would die in the melee, including the commander of the force, Captain James Dalyell, whose corpse was decapitated so that his head could be paraded around on a stick for all to see. Eyewitnesses, including many of the soldiers themselves, would claim that they had seen more than Anne Rouge sitting upon the banks of the creek before the battle, as if claiming a front row seat and waiting with glee to witness the carnage. In the aftermath of the fighting, the fearsome little dwarf was then allegedly witnessed to frolic and dance among the corpses that littered the ground and to wade about in the blood-stained waters of the creek. The creature's demeanor was described as being joyous and elated, as if celebrating the bloodshed. In 1996, the Michigan Believer ran a story about a pair of witnesses who claimed that they had just exited a nightclub when they saw a tiny, hunched-over man wearing what looked like a filthy, tattered old fur coat flee an attempted car burglary while making a cawing sound similar to a crow. As recently as 2017, there have been reports of the Nan Rouge or Pygmy 
One commenter on Reddit called The Infamous 99 gave two curious accounts of what appears to be the creature saying, These two stories came from two people who knew nothing of the other. My great aunt says that when she was little, she'd seen a gnome on several occasions. It would stare at her and even followed her. The last time she seen it was at a funeral home and it wanted her to go into a cellar and she felt it was evil by then. When she told me and my sister this story as an old woman, she looked disturbed and says she has carried a cross ever since. My sister and I were very young, so we didn't really get many details. One regret I have is not finding out more. My family believed her or at least believed she had thought she'd seen it. No one is alive that would have any more information about her sighting. The next person to tell me a related account was my close friend's older sister. She said she was chased by an evil little creature at her bus stop. She described it as a gnome and my friends would clown on her about it. And now that I'm older and more mature and very much interested in the supernatural, I regret not listening to her. She had a hard time even talking about it, or when we would joke about it. She said it was very small, smaller than she was as an eight-year-old girl. It had white fur and a pointy red hat. Thank you for watching Murder, Monsters and Mysteries. If you enjoyed tonight's video, please like and subscribe as we'll be uploading more regularly.